Hello. Um, good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, wherever you are. Um, welcome to this webinar to talk about the Global Open Data Index. It is a pleasure to have uh, Mor Rubenstein and Danny Lammerherd from uh, our team that have, have been working really hard on the index for um, measuring the state of open government data around the world. So first thing we want to, I'm going to share this real quick so you can see something prettier than just my face. Um, and so first of all, we wanted to talk a bit about like what the index is, uh, where it comes from, and from there we will continue to talk about how it changed for this year specifically and what we've learned um, from the assessment for 2016. So basically the index is composed of a survey where we assess a group of key data sets that should be collected and published by governments on the national level from all around the world. It is based, it relies on our community uh, who each year very bravely go and look for the data uh, in their government portals or in the websites, transparency portals, um, anywhere they can. And why is that important? Um, well, we think that these key data sets uh, can provide some sort of uh, tool uh, to follow up on how money is spent, on how population is growing, on uh, different key um, social issues that we should start tackling and that open data can um, help work on. And it is mainly uh, focused on open data activists or organizations that use data as their core, but it is um, designed in a way that can be used by anyone, by everyone, um, with a little understanding of what they're looking for. And so this year we have gone through some changes that maybe more you can tell us a bit more about uh, the changes we've gone through in the methodology and how we designed this year um, our survey. So hi everybody. Um, as my third edition of uh, Godi, I'm really happy to be here. Um, so basically this year we've done some changes in the index design. As you know, every year we look and try to see what works for everybody. It, and as we know, we can never um, please everyone. But what we try to do a bit this time is to look at our key data sets and to understand what exactly are we looking for in the key data set. And then we want to see how we actually, what we need to look in data sets in order to make them relevant. And then we need to see um, how we change them. So lucky this year we had Danny to help us make all of this survey design. And that is very, very helpful. So Danny is going to help explain a bit his point of view of why he did the survey design. Danny? Hi, uh, hi everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, so basically, if I want to, or if I if I shall explain the methodology of uh, the Global Open Data Index, as you already said, uh, Mo and Oscar, we have um, two uh, components of that. So one is the survey design, and the other one is the definition of the data we are actually assessing. So um, <clears throat> for the survey design itself. Um, we um, so we changed we changed a couple of questions this year that um, and, and wanted to to have the focus more on uh, first of all the open definition and second um, the open data charter. So we've seen that or we we saw the importance that um, that we metrify and measure um, certain elements of the open data charter because this is a, a policy tool that that we. Uh, 
um, we would like to to support with with obviously evidence um, and yeah this was one of the main reasons that we uh, changed uh, um, the survey and the way we changed it is that um, we re removed um, questions from last years or recent years um, that were more looking into um, data like is the data in a digital format available which could be is the data stored on a dvd and can be um, um, for example um, purchased or ordered so these are these are elements of open uh, of, of data uh, publication that are not necessarily related to open data so we really wanted to only focus on um, the key points of open data like is it published online is it published maybe without any um, administrative hurdles is it for free is it openly licensed and so on and so on um, we added two uh, questions too um, that look more into the as we call it practical openness so uh, on the one hand looking into data findability and on the other hand uh, looking into how usable do people perceive um, the data or how, how what um, what is the perceived usability of this data set when I speak about perceived usability I mean that um, we look into um, or we, we assessed uh, usability by asking our submitters and reviewers to look into the data set and then to just give an assessment of um, would this, this data be useful for your use purpose? Because obviously usability can vary sometimes. Sometimes you only need a quick overview into a budget. Sometimes you really need to, um, the disaggregated figures and so on. And this is how we experimented with that. Um, but we didn't score these questions because um, they are they are still subjective and we would like to have a first um, first overview of um, um, if this type of question works or if we should maybe um, uh, use other questions. So and the questions that are scored uh, really come from the open definition and um, yeah, um, the, the scoring itself was changed a bit too. So we wanted to be a bit more balanced and not give too much um, emphasis on or stress uh, too much um, the legal status of data and the machine readability of data, uh, which are obviously core requirements and they are still scoring quite high. But we lowered the score of these two questions and added up um, other um, or added more weight to, to other questions like is it available for free or published online and so on. So this is about um, this is all about the survey design. Um, and I can directly go into how we define the key data sets if Mo and Oscar agree. Um, <laughs> I think so. Okay. Yep. Yes, so um, for the for the key data sets, um, there are a couple of things that uh, I have to talk about. So the first one is obviously what is a key data set, and it it all started a couple of years ago when it was still fairly arcane. Um, people just um, published a list of data sets like the first open data charter talked about we should have information on this and this and this and this um, societal sector if you want. Um, basically, if you want to cut it down, it's key data set is a set of information that is relevant for society to be published online as open data. And what does a key data set contain? It contains certain data points. So let's say, for example, pollutants that are important to, to be available around the world, like water pollutants, air pollutants, um, or it could also contain things like, um, for example, weather observations, um, temperature, um, temperature history, for example, or the development of temperature. Um, it can contain um, transactional data for spending and so on and so on. So these are the data points, basically the content. It's basically a, the content that you work with. And then there are, th um, that there are th three points um, linked to that. So the, the first one is the disaggregation level. So how detailed is this information? The second one is coverage. So um, for, which, for which areas do we, do we get this information? This is relevant, for example, um, looking into water quality. We want to have obviously water quality for the entire national territory uh, or we want to have air quality for the entire national territory so we define these things and the thir third one is update frequency obviously people can't really work with data that is outdated so <laughs> we we define update frequencies for each data set and they vary obviously um, between each data set um, and why do we use these key data sets that's now the second question um, because people often approach us and ask why do you use these really specific data sets? The open data barometer doesn't do that, for example. Why do you do that? 
And um, we have um, three, three answers to that. So the first one is, it is about relevance. So um, we want to assess data that has at least proven somehow in the past that it is um, useful or usable. So um, what we are doing is we are basing our statement of data relevance on user stories. So this is um, a technique basically asking who uses what data for what purpose. And we look into existing use cases or we are looking into, for example, recommendations of lead organizations uh, in their respective um, respective sectors, like open contracting or the open um, open corporates. Um, uh, and we also look into established standards. So the relevance is, is based on, on these um, on these factors. And uh, we try to make a sound um, statement that the data we are collecting is actually usable somehow. Um, the second point is, why do, we why do we use key data sets? It is a proxy for open data publication at large. So that means if you look, for example, at the most recent um, statement of the Australian government, they said, we have published now 20,000 <laughs> 20, data sets, which is great. Um, how, would you, how would you assess that? It is, it is uh, obviously impossible. So we have to pick certain data that is a good proxy to, um, um, to be available, um, to be able to um, make a statement about how, how does open data um, develop in a country. And this is um, why we choose these key data sets too, because we think that they are good indicators for that. The third point is, it has methodological reasons. So, um, <clears throat> okay, it looks like Danny had some uh, technical issues. Um, so we basically have a methodological idea of understanding. I can just like basically run as Danny's coming back. So basically the idea is that when we have a clear methodology um, and a clear definition of what we're looking for, it's easier to compare them rather when you don't. Um, so you have to know exactly what you're looking for. When you say I'm looking for budget data, but there are thousands of ways of looking at budget, then we're actually comparing apples to oranges. And the idea of doing this and have the characteristic comes from our dear beloved community who said to themselves um, that it's really hard to compare something when we don't have characteristic. So while it's really sometimes annoying uh, to some people to see the characteristic, we think that it's really important for us as civil society to identify what do we need to look at um, so, and what we've done. So for the last two years, we've been revising the categories. Last year, we introduced characteristic as an experiment, and we were very generous, which is something that it's really important to say. And why we were generous is because it was the first time that we experimented with it. So we tried to see what works and what doesn't work. Um, this year, on the other hand, we are a bit more strict. And why we're a bit more strict? Because we know what we're looking for. So if you look at, um, if you look at election results, if you look at water quality, we use the same, um, the same reviewers to review them. And we've been a bit more strict. So if you, see, if you ask yourself, why this year um, I've been scored zero, what last year I've been scored more, the answer is it's become more rigorous. Um, this is why we also say that you can't compare last year's index to this year's index because we grow more, we understand more what we're looking for and our methodology is completely different. So if any of you try to say yes, but now we're doing better in spending data, then you need to look really hard and understand if you did or if we change our methodology. So try not to compare between 2015 and 2016. Um, so it's really helped us to do that. And we've done some major changes in this. So A, we added two new data sets uh, based on a consultation that we done uh, in 2015. So we added draft legislation, which is one of the main data sets when you want to assess parliament. Uh, and we also added administra administrative boundaries. And the reason, that we added administrative boundaries is that a lot of countries do not use zip code, which is one of the data sets that we do assess in the index. And a lot of people do need the administrative boundaries to do a civic tech work, um, mainly also an election, but not only, like it can be also zoning and other different issues. So administrative boundaries are there and administrative boundaries has a standard. So it's really easy to look at it um, compared to the UN standard. And we also, as I said, be more rigorous 
on a couple of revised data sets. We had the fellowship with Cadasta, a great organization to work on land ownership, and we made a better changes there. We looked at weather data, we look at air quality, location data, national maps, and we've been a lot more rigorous and a lot more um, strict on the definition that we're putting there. Um, so this is why we do it. We also basically try to see with you, the co community, what is better in this segregated, what is valid, what is not valid, who produced the data, um, and we try to make as much as we can to standards. Um, so that's about why you can see different um, different things. Here's Danny back. Uh, Danny took over your uh, explanation about characteristic, but now I can continue and say that because that we've done this massive change in the methodology, we decided this year to be groundbreaking and release the index as a temporal thing. And why I'm saying groundbreaking, because in the years before, we used to basically do this big um, press release saying people, here is the index, here is the results, um, and then not to change it. And because the index is crowdsourced and because the index is having a lot of people involved in it, we know that it's prone sometimes to um, mistakes. So we acknowledge it. And we thought to ourselves, how can we make these mistakes some kind of a benefit? And the idea was to create this public dialogue um, like space. And this is what we do. So if you go to our um, um, forum at discuss.okfn.org, you will see a lot of people commenting about the data sets. And the idea is to create a place where people can speak to one another, data publisher and data users can share experiences, can explain, can discuss the data set if it's valid or not. But we can also engage people in understanding the characteristic that we put, which is super important in this day and age. Um, and then at the end of this public dialogue phase, which I repeat, everyone can join and everyone can comment. At the end of it, we are gonna basically have a look and we're going to see which data set needs to be changed, which data set doesn't need to be changed, don't need to be changed, and how can we make the index a better product? Um, and what can we learn from all of the um, all of the feedback that we're getting in the forum? And currently, we got over 80 uh, comments about the index, which is amazing. Uh, and we're looking for more. Uh, the more comments and the more ideas of how to, did we do a good job, or if we... Uh, and capture the right data sets, the better for us. Um, so we do encourage all of you to come and tell us if you find the stuff that we were looking for, if you didn't, uh, and if we were assessed one category wrongly, we would really like to hear from you and see um, where was it. Um, so this is what we're doing it, and we're really proud of this experiment that we're doing, uh, and we really want to engage with you, 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 and you. So please uh, come and tell us. Um, what, uh, what's going on, what we didn't capture right uh, in your country of relevance. Or if you don't live in this country and you have like a theme to heart, like the open contracting people who likes to look at the procurement uh, data sets, do it as well. Um, so we invite all of you to come and, and connect and um, create this dialogue so we can create a better open data publication to all. Um, so I think now we're on almost 320. So maybe, Oscar, do you want to open the floor for questions? I think uh, the easiest way, since apparently Q&A in the new Google Hangouts is a bit complicated, uh, what we could do is maybe follow. You can tweet to us, um, either mention more or Danny or um, Open Knowledge at OKFN. Uh, and use the GoDee 2016 hashtag to post a question, and we'll follow up uh, on it and try to answer all of them at the end of the call. Um, because I think there is one very important question that we should cover, and it is what have we learned from measuring from uh, the assessment of GoDee this year? Uh, are there any key learnings that we have got so far? Um, maybe, Danny, if you can, um, are, are, are you there? Yes, we can.
Yeah, I think you, you if yeah. Danny, can you stop for a second? I think that people can't hear you. I want to say on the chat. Can can someone confirm to me that you can't hear Danny? I can hear you, but I think the people in the chat can't hear you. So if someone can please write to me on the live chat, that would be helpful. Nani, maybe, or Catherine. I'll try to to outreach them. Um, I'm just asking. Um, okay, let's try to do it now uh, and see if it works, Danny. Can't hear Danny. Okay, so Danny, we can't hear you, according to Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Yeah, people say they can't hear you, Danny. Uh, so if you can go in and out, that would be great. And in the meanwhile, and maybe turn off your like videos. So try to come into the Hangouts. Um, in a cool. So while Danny's speaking, thank you guys uh, for helping me. Um, you're also great. So basically, what Danny tried to say is, let's see if we can hear Danny. Danny, can you Hi. speak? And let's see if the community can hear you. Community, please help and tell me. Please. And he said, community, please hear me. Community, please hear me. Can you hear me? Ground control to Major Tom. He just, he, yeah. OK, Nanny said that we can hear you. Great, Danny, speak. OK, perfect. So um, I don't know how much you heard, <laughs> but um, just to, to um, go back to the data quality uh, aspect. Um, so just to wrap it up quickly, data quality is an important issue for us uh, for the entire research process. Um, and uh, when I'm talking about data quality, I don't mean necessarily data structure or you know um, syntax or coding or whatever, blah, blah. Um, I'm, I'm talking about um, uh, the representation of data. So how is data presented online? Because data can come in, in a lot of forms, you know, it can be a dashboard, it can be a visualization, it can be this and that. So, um, and for data quality to assess, um, for example, we often have these hurdles that we don't find metadata that describe um, the information. I can only talk about um, one example I came across a lot uh, with weather data, for example. So, um, if I assess weather data, I often have um, information on temperature, I have information on rainfall and on other things. And sometimes this information is not included in a data set. But I can't interpret, is it, is it now that they don't publish this information? Or is it just not relevant for this time and date because there is no rainfall for this date? Um, and that means that metadata is really important for us to interpret and to understand the data, um, especially since we use these, um, um, these specific um, key data sets. So metadata is, is, is really crucial here, um, or any explanation about the data. <clears throat> 
Sometimes it's also, um, it can also be that the aggregation level is hard to evaluate. For example, uh, with election results, um, sometimes it is, it is really a question of how do you even assess the polling station level. It, it was, um, um, or, or the same with spending data. Um, you have spending data on contracts, um, public procurement. And where do you draw the line between, is it now, uh, or where, where do you, where do you, can identify uh, an, an individual transaction. Sometimes that's a bit hard to, um, to tell. So aggregation level is also something that is important. And um, yeah, the third point was um, uh, unusual presentations, like if data comes in any images or, in, uh, or you have to look into the HTML code to find any descriptions about that. That's all uh, part of, of the issue that um, data quality heavily impedes our work and makes uh, the assessment very hard and um, uh, also increases the, the workload and the time we need to spend uh, on finding the data. And vice versa also, um, it is important for, um, for the regular users, if you think. Um, maybe more you can talk about data findability quickly. I'll be happy to speak about data findability. Where is the great comics that we have about the, the great image? So this year we ask Andy Dickinson, who is great. Um, to do some basically uh, images to explain the index in a more relatable way. Um, so it's pretty cool. So you can see the usual data suspects and the idea is that data is out there all the time and it looks almost the same. Uh, and sometimes it's actually the same data sets in different places. Uh, and sometimes it's different data sets that give the same answer to the same questions, but in different places. So you can you need to basically combine them both in order to find them. Um, so data findability become a crucial thing. So if you think about it in the past, we said that all the data is going to be on an open data portal um, and it's going to be saved there. But in reality, and we see it specifically in the UK, the data is not updated on the portal and you have to go to specific department um, website in order to find it. And that can be super much of a hassle. Um, so if you're looking at, um, for example, um, just the spending data of the UK, you can find in four di 40 different URLs, that's what you heard, 40 different URLs, because you can't find data anywhere uh, in one place. Uh, but moreover, you can't even find it on the portal. Uh, sometimes you can find it on the portal, but it's not the full one, and the government decided to publish it on different places. And I think the data findability and the idea of finding it shows also about usability, because if you cannot find the right data that you're looking for or it takes you forever, you can't use it. And we always speak about we need to show the impact of open data, we need to use it, but if you can't find it, then you can't use it, right? Um, so we need to think, and I think the index show it really prominently, how we find the right data set and how we make them even findable for users. And if they're not on the portal, that also means something. So how can we make it more relevant for that? And how can we make sure that we capture it in one place? So this is why we, we see a lot of data findability. And this is also why we do um, the public dialogue because we know that sometimes we just can't find it and the government can and they can show to us and then we can give them a score. So we hope that by um, looking at it, government can get a bit more and publishers can get a bit more of understanding where the data is and where the data is not and why the user can't find it. So that's about that. Okay, so um, <clears throat> maybe one one um, small addition be before I move to um, the what does zero percent mean question. So it's also interesting, I think, for everyone who is interested more in data findability uh, to look into the index results and to check, for example, how many URLs you find. Because one of the things we added this year is um, to uh, in our in our um, in our results pages. Um, just the, the single URLs where, where you can find information. I think it's already interesting because sometimes you see, um, you know, the domain names are different, um, the publishers are different, and so on. So this tells you already something about um, yeah, the different places where, where data is, um, is stored online, um, just as, a, as an addition to that. And now <clears throat> talking about what does 0% uh, uh, at Godi 2016 mean? So um, I think this, <laughs> this is one of the most crucial, crucial questions here. Um, it basically means two things. So the, the, first, the first point is we, we, often, or we sometimes find data gaps. 
So data gaps is from the um, from the United Nations lingo um, inspired by the data revolution, basically just saying that um, sometimes governments don't provide um, certain information. They don't produce certain information. And um, for example, because their administrative systems don't have any procedures in place or because their statistical systems um, don't cover certain information, it doesn't matter um, what the reason is, but um, and the point is governments from the from the starting point already don't produce certain information it can be uh, air quality measurements in west africa it can be postal codes that are often not um, established in, in 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 certain regions in the world um it can also be for example um now i i'm missing the the third example anyway but <clears throat> so we find these data gaps Land registries, yeah, land registries was the was the third example I wanted to mention. So um, that's one one point. If we don't find these these um, the data, obviously it's not available. So um, it means that that um, it can't score at all. Um, in future, we we would like to um, experiment with a more sensitive ranking, which uh, takes into account the country context, because obviously at the moment it's penalizing countries, and this is not um, this is not uh, I think the most ideal case. How we could design the ranking or any form of presenting the um, the results of Gaudi, um, but. This is something that we have to experiment in the in the future or think about, and your input would also be very welcome um, on that. Um, then the second point is: so we also have a zero percent score if the data is not compliant with the key data set. So um, what does it mean? It basically means that uh, often we defined um, um, certain aspects of the key data set as required. So all of the information must be somehow available. That means, for example, that budget information should not only contain a statement of how much budget is allocated to each um, government unit, but also um, it should be disaggregated into, uh, let's say, programs or um, yeah, uh, the next the next um, level of disaggregation, if you want. So. <clears throat> And just as an example, so and if the if we don't find all the required information online, we say that the data is not published. The data is not uh, is not existent online. Um, that's basically it. But if we find all the information online, then we do the assessment um, and and refer basically all our survey questions to all the information we find online. Um, but yeah, th there are some issues with that that we we learned about that this year. Um, so we have, for example, issues that uh, certain data categories are very precise, uh, especially data characteristics where we have existing standards like uh, open contracting or, um, or let's say the, the, the public procurement um, data category we are measuring or also environmental data we are assessing like air quality or um, yeah, um, water quality. Others are still fairly broad, like um, budgets, for example, or even spending, because we don't specify um, uh, on what um, or which which parts of the spending we want to look at. We look into the transactions, but we don't look, is it now spending for loans, for grants, for whatever, so <clears throat> for subsidies. Um, so um, and the problem is sometimes here that there are, there are maybe at least three three critique points we can mention. Um, the disaggregation level of our key um, data sets is perceived as an issue. So people from the community got back to us and said, well, um, the data is simply not provided. Um, like elections data and polling station data is often not provided. Why would you assess that? Um, so it appears to be overly harsh. But um, we think that still polling station data is the most uh, is the most disaggregate you can get, and the disaggregation level should um, should uh, further be supported. Um, not sometimes also the disaggregation level appears to be not feasible to assess. So, <clears throat> for example, um, with water quality, we face the issue that uh, water quality is um, often collected on a local level, and what we would need to do in order to get this aggregate um, information for each water source in the country, uh, go into different water providers, for example, and look if uh, on the pages of them, of these water providers, I mean, and then look um, if they publish data or not. So this is, uh, this is um, at the moment not feasible, 
And so in this case, for example, we said, okay, we want to look into um, aggregated national reports if they are available, because that is already sometimes challenging. And um, yeah, so this is about the disengagement level. And I think this is an issue that, that we would like to discuss with you further. What is desirable disaggregation level and what is a not desirable disaggregation level and what is also feasible and not? So um, that's so far to the disaggregation. The second point is timeliness. Timeliness is sometimes still perceived as an issue. So um, the update frequencies we, uh, we define are sometimes seen as uh, overly ambitious, especially for national statistics. And we definitely have to refine there. The third point is, Sometimes people say that single data elements that we have in our key characteristics are not entirely crucial. So they're, they're, not, um, they're not the most crucial ones to have, like, for example, um, addresses of companies in a company register. Um, and we would, uh, we would like to open the debate for that and also maybe have a more open discussion about, okay, which data elements should we then include? Should we... Um, should we include other data elements or maybe um, should we maybe also be more um, more open about the data we are assessing so that means that we don't have a hard stance with required data but have more optional data that people can choose from but this would then basically mean that we have to have a good argument to say that each of these data elements are equally important somehow so um, and these are these are questions that we that came up um, during our assessment, and we would like to use also the public consultation phase to uh, address these questions together with you in our forum. Um, I would say I that's that's where I'm stopping, and maybe uh, more and Oscar want to add here. I think that we are good. And I, I just want to add one thing that if you want to see more of our insights, go to the index. Um, so index.okfen.org slash insights. Uh, you can also add your insights to us. So please send us your blog post and we will uh, publish them if they're relevant and connected. Um, see uh, an example of what the Open Contracting Partnership did, um, which is actually looking at all of the um, index results about um, document and speak about it, but that's for me. Um, Cause I, I think we want to open the floor for question, right? Oscar? Yes, exactly. So um, if you want to use the chat in the um, YouTube live uh, chat uh, next to the, to the video window, or if you want to use Twitter, you can just use uh, the go 16 hashtag and um, tag OKFN. Uh, so we have one, you have, we have three questions so far um, from Martin. Hi, Martin. Uh, so the question was if the ranking places can change uh, after the um, public dialogue uh, session. I don't know if uh, who wants to answer that one. I mean, it, that all depends on how um, how the dialogue develops. So I can totally see that, for example, if we say um, we spot evident mistakes, like um, saying, you know, we find spending data that is um, that is actually budget data or executed budget or something, then we would obviously have to re um, um, correct that. And if we can't find spending data that that would replace this budget data, then um, we would obviously change the score. And in the end, that would also affect the ranking. So um, I think that is open just to how the, uh, how the um, discussion develops. So please do feel free um, to also propose, maybe if you find data sets that are more representative, please, please do um, um, send them over to us through the forum and then we can um, um, get in dialogue with each other. So. And just to re-emphasize, uh, in this uh, post-news era that we did write that the uh, ranking can change or may change. Uh, so if your government said that they're currently number 20, that's great. Uh, but uh, make sure that they understand this is an initial, um, um, like, basically ranking. And I can send you something that the Australian um, media did when they wrote there clearly that this is an initial 
um, ranking and the full ranking will be published uh, by mid June. And again, we want to do that so we can make sure that we put the right data sets in. And it's really good to see already even government people um, telling us when we gave them a high score and they were like, no, actually, this does not exist. So just to let you know. Um, so it's really important to get all your feedback about stuff that exists and stuff that we miss, um, haven't done very well. So please keep, and yeah, it will change. So make sure that you tell the people who publish um, that this is an initial uh, ranking. Yeah, so the, I think in the end, the valuable uh, part of this experiment will be that, like see um, how much we can involve the people in government that actually know where the data is um, because of the issues we, we talked about, the data findability um issue how we can tackle that for next year and how can we collaborate since the beginning um, with uh the data producers as well right yeah and we're also collecting everything now so people ask when is the reevaluation will happen so we collect everything now until the fifth until the second of, of june and after the second of june we will have a very clear understanding of what we're looking at and we can reevaluate and change score if needed then but we want to be very consistent in how we're doing it. So we're not going to do that as people tell us that there is a mistake. We want to really look at everything on an equal level. Um, so it will be reliable measurement. Um, so it's not going to happen in the next couple of days. It's going to happen after the 2nd of June for these reasons. Yes. So, and there's another question for Danny. Uh, how deep into the data set should one look uh, into in order to assess it for the index? Is if it's published, but can't be used, should one try to use it? Uh, for example, visualize it or cross it with another, another data set before evaluating? This is a very good question. <laughs> this is a very good question. So I would say, <laughs> so normally um, throughout our process, what we did is um, basically looking into different websites. And then um, if you can find all the information that we specified, then this should be uh, this should be enough. So there is no need to. Um, I don't know if I understand the the question correctly, but there shouldn't be a need to to um, to link the data set to something else to make every any cross references or something. Um, I think in terms of um, the le level of detail, that depends a bit on the data category. Like um, with with company registers, if you if you look into company registers, we want to assess if um, a company register provides information for um, for the entire country. This is sometimes hard to assess if you have one company register and you have to see if companies are uh, listed um, in different regions and so on. So this uh, requires a bit more work. Um, and uh, yeah, to, to make a statement basically to say that um, this data is actually covering not only one region, but the entire, um, the entire country. So uh, I think uh, it depends a bit, but uh, you can also post something on the discuss forum and um, then I'm happy to expand a bit more if you have a question directly for one data category. And um, also to, to say a bit more, if you go to goodtables.io, which is a new frictionless data that is coming out of open knowledge, you can also see um, how you can check the real quality of schemas of tables uh, and it's free to use. So we haven't used it in this index version yet because um, it's we we are trying to understand how people can actually connect to relevant data sets so you can see if their quality is good uh, and if they're usable. Uh, but if you for now looking for any kind of data set that want to see if it's usable and it's the if the quality is okay, just you use goodtables.io. We're very proud of that product and uh, we'll be happy to get your feedback about it as well. Um, so maybe maybe next year is we're gonna um, coordinate the index with it and have like this beautiful um, assessment also of qualities of schemas. Maybe just one one point to add to um, how deep you should go into the assessment. I think uh, actually the the current I wouldn't say controversy, but at least uh, the upcoming you know uh, debates we have around spending is really interesting. If you assess spending data, you know. Um, um, which which types of spending data do you find, for example, that actually applies to every data category? You know, which which data do you find, and how are they presented, and so on and so on. That gives us a more nuanced understanding of what we are actually measuring, because sometimes you know um, we are still not we are still not overly precise. So please please do document these things because that also helps uh, informing the key data sets in the end. 
and please do also engage in the debate about the key data sets then just uh, a last add-on over to you oscar yeah so we have um well it's two questions that are related uh about the time and i think more mentioned it but they're asking when will we have answered to all of the entries in the forum uh yeah, so one is when we'll be uh, finished with the evaluation of the submissions um, that are have comments there, and the other um, when will be when will be answer to all the entries in the forum. So Danny did share a massive table that like shows all of the questions in the forum and who answered them and why and how. It's fairly transparent. Um, so that it, Danny can probably share the link again and you can see uh, when we answer in how because sometimes we do speak to reviewers, sometimes we do it ourselves, we also have other stuff to do, um, but we try to get it as fast as possible that we can actually answer each and every one of them. Um, so this is going to come in the, up, the upcoming month. It doesn't mean that we're going to change the index specifically uh, while we do it, but we try to make it, as I said before, systematic as possible so it will also be very reliable. Um, and then should I also answer the question from Colombia? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so if, um, so basically I see that the uh, question is, um, all the replies that were made in the portal were they expected to be answered. So if the portals mean um, uh, global.survey.okfn.org, we're not gonna answer them. So we basically uh, close the survey to submissions and we only answer questions in the forum. So if you made any kind of submission to the survey, I'm sorry, we're gonna basically not use them. We want to see something that is more, um, more combining of a dialogue and speaking together and the index platform doesn't allow to do it now because you can only send one uh, submission at a time. So if you made any kind of, of a submission there and you want us to reevaluate, you have to basically put all of them back in the forum uh, and see how other people interact with them. So Colombia, I think that you guys already put most of it, but make sure that you put all of your uh, questions and comments in the forum, in the discuss, and you can do that by go to the index. And then at the end of an evaluation of a data set, there is a button named uh, this, uh, go to discuss in forum, and it's open, um, basically a category if it's not open yet. Um, so if you made it in the portal, I'm sorry, uh, we're not gonna do it, but if you made it in the um, forum, then yes. And the idea is that we want more people speaking about it and see um, the answer that are coming. So that's from us. Yes. Also, it, it is important to have it in the open because, um, well, at least for us, it is very important that everyone who is involved in those conversations um, can see uh, the exchange that happens there. Um, then we have a comment from Nanny uh, about doing the outreach not in the months of November and December. That is a very good suggestion, and uh, we are very aware that those can be complicated months. And uh, well, we want to thank everyone who contributed, even though uh, we had to go through the assessment uh, during those months and the beginning of this year. Uh, it, we really appreciate uh, the time and effort that you put into assessing, especially Nanny, who helped us um, with doing uh, community outreach in uh, Southeast Asia. So uh, yeah, that, that is something that we definitely need to work on uh, for the next edition of the index. One question that I would like to ask, how much more transparent can we get? Uh, because, you know, as advocates of open science, it is actually a bit schizophrenic if we don't publish what we are doing internally. So <laughs> if you have any questions of what we should publish, what is unclear to you, please do get in touch with us because it is um, obviously also in our interest to, uh, we want to also support, you know, making uh, our rationale most open to you. Please. Good science is done when everything is known. So yeah, uh, we, we do do what we preach. And also, 
if you're really into it and you didn't understand something and you want to see what's up, you can also look at our reviewers' diaries, which is the first that we ever done. So all of our reviewers put the diaries out and we publish them on the website. Um, so if you really want to see a category and you want to see what the reviewers found and what's interesting, you can actually have a look um, at the reviewer diaries. So uh, please uh, tell us what else do you need from us in order to be more transparent and we will comply. Yes, so if um, we have 10 minutes to get to the hour, but if there aren't any other questions, if we were, were uh, more and Danny were so clear in all their explanations that uh, there are no <laughs> that, that there are no further questions. Um, we can start wrapping up unless uh, uh, one of our viewers wants to um, ask anything else. And if not, you can always uh, ask us anything through Twitter uh, on our Facebook page or in a discus forum and yeah I, it's discus.okfn.org and at okfn on twitter and open knowledge international on facebook so so many names <laughs> yes uh we'll hopefully fix that soon but yeah. uh for now you can just go through all of the different um, social networks that we have. And remember that this session was recorded, so you can share it with people that you think might be interested in watching it. Uh, we will try to add subtitles to it in different languages. So if you can um, give time to translate, that will also be very welcome. And because we want to include as many people as possible. And yeah, uh, thank you more. Thank you, Danny, for this great session. And you thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone who watched the webinar. And hopefully, it was useful for, um, for the people watching. And hopefully, it will provide even more insights to you. And Maybe you can read more about everything on index.okfn.org. And yeah, thank you very much. Cool. Bye. Right, thank you, all community. Bye. You're great. Thank you for all the questions. Bye bye. Great. Bye.